Almighty God, we pray for your blessing upon this council. Help and prosper its work for the advancement and benefit of its people, so that peace and happiness, unity and justice may be established among us all. Amen. Manningham Council acknowledges the Wurundjeri Woiwurrung people as the traditional owners of the land and waterways now known as Manningham. Council pays respects to elders past, present and emerging and values their ongoing contribution to enrich and appreciate the cultural heritage of Manningham. Council acknowledges and respects Australia's First Peoples as traditional owners of lands and waterways across country and encourages reconciliation between all. Manningham Council also values the contribution made to Manningham over the years by people of diverse backgrounds and cultures. Welcome everybody. I welcome all members of the public who have joined us in person and online to observe tonight's proceedings. I would like to advise that tonight's meeting is being audio and video recorded. All care will be taken to maintain your privacy. How is it? However, as a visitor in the public gallery, your presence may be recorded. By remaining in the gallery, it is assumed your consent is given in the event your voice and or image is broadcast by council. Council meetings are conducted in accordance with our governance rules. I will introduce each item of business as listed on the agenda by calling it by number and reading the title. I'll then call for a mover and seconder of a motion on the item before opening any debate. Only councillors are able to join the debate on an item. Councillors may adopt the officer's recommendation in the report or propose amendments and supplementary motions. I would like to draw your attention to item seven on tonight's agenda, public question time, which provides an opportunity to ask questions of the council. Council has allocated 30 minutes for question time at tonight's meeting and the process for public question time is set out in our governance rules. Questions must be received prior to the start of the meeting to be asked where we receive advance notice of a question in accordance with our governance rules. We will provide a verbal response to the question at our meeting. Questions received up to 7 p.m. today may be taken on notice if we don't have the information on hand to provide a meaningful response. If this happens, you'll be provided with a written response to your question within 10 working days. I will deal with a maximum of two questions per person and two questions on any one issue. You will be asked to come forward to the lectern to ask your question where you will have the opportunity to provide a two minute introductory statement before asking your question. If you have more than two questions, please submit these additional questions in writing to council through the normal channels. To ensure the efficient conduct of our meeting and maximum participation during question time, all questions and answers shall be as brief as possible and no discussion is permitted on any question. Councillors and the gallery are reminded that question time is to be conducted in a respectful manner and any disorderly conduct will be managed in accordance with our governance rules. Item two, apologies and requests for leave of absence. So I have received an apology from Councillor Gough for tonight's meeting. I also note that Councillor Lightbody has been granted a leave of absence until the 27th of August 2023. Are there any other apologies or requests for leave of absence? None noted, thank you. Item number three, prior notification of conflict of interest. No prior notifications of conflict of interest have been received. Would anyone like to give notice of a conflict of interest? Thank you. Item number four, confirmation of minutes. Do I have a mover? Councillor Conlon? It's a lot to move that the minutes of the council meeting held on 25th of July, 2023 be confirmed. Thank you. Do I have a seconder? Councillor Anna Chen. All those in favour? And that's carried unanimously. Thank you. Item number five, presentations. There are no presentations tonight. Item number six, petitions. And there are no petitions tonight. Item number seven, public question time. So we have received a couple of questions for tonight's council meeting. Anyone submitting a question to council will have the opportunity to read out their question or can choose to have their question read out by our CEO. 
Our first question is from Gary Siganek. Gary, would you like to come to the lectern? As before, you have two minutes to make an introductory statement before asking your questions. Thank you, Gary. Thank you, Council. I've had the pleasure of dealing with Pam from Civic Compliance in regards to Aldi with their responsibilities with a car park and allowing access from 6.30 a.m. The trade has paid for this car park and with the council's assistance to help a developer now means we are treated like second class part owners of the site. I'd like to acknowledge Pam for, the following, for following proper procedures and informing Aldi of their obligations. Pam is a great officer, diligent and polite. This example is in sharp contrast to my dealings with council in regards to Maston Square over the last two years because of the council's playing of politics to hide their true agenda. Why has the sale come into consideration for its removal? It is part of the fabric of the centre. It's the only place a school band can play at Christmas time where there is room and shelter from the elements. If anything, that area should be enhanced. When you look at the evidence, you can only draw one conclusion. It's in the way of a future development. The council has stated they weren't prepared to compromise on their vision to build a park the size of a house block six to eight times bigger than Templestowe Village on Tunstall Squares Park. Why? The townhouses being constructed on the west side of the centre are facing a dedicated laneway which services these shops. This means the residents will have priority over the businesses or it or is it your vision that once the centre is crushed financially, these shops will no longer be there, problem disappears? The area has been rezoned for high density living and that is what is driving these decisions. But first you have to ruin the business viability of the centre and constrict it physically to seems to be the agenda. A developer should pay fair market price for any future development, but what is not up for compromise is our road and car park, car park layout for a cheap land grab. This will only destroy small business and investors and take away from the community their much needed shops and put them at heightened risk of accidents and personal injury. Again, no to narrowing of Masterton Road, keep Masterton Square safe. Okay, question one. After many attempts and being ignored, we are asking again for the plans and the scope for the Maston Square of Amenities upgrades. Where are they? Question two. This has never been on the table and it was and is the centrepiece of the traders' plan. Why is the council looking or even suggesting to take down our sale? Is it because they want to make way and eventually hand over a house block size of the community's land to a developer for apartments? Thank you. Thank you, Gary. I'll ask Christian Shabrayan, Sabrayan, sorry, Christian, Acting Director of City Services, to respond. Evening, all. Um, so, in relation to question one, so following the meeting in April 2023, officers have commenced the implementation of a series of minor amenity and safety works at Macedon Square. The works form part of Council's normal asset maintenance program and genuinely constitute of a like-for-like -like replacement. The program includes the installation of safety bollards, which have subsequently been completed, repairing broken pavers and curbs. It will also involve the removal of a small numbers of vegetation which are damaging existing infrastructure, which will be replanted. Um, there will be no change to either the road or the footpath footprints. With regards to question two on the shade cells, uh, currently no decisions have been made on the shade cells. Officers have received feedback regarding the shade cells and are investigating options to further improve the immunity of the area encompassed by the shade cells. We will keep our, the traders and our community informed along the way. There is currently no further project in planning for future development of the site. Thank you. Thank you, Christian, and thank you, Gary. Item number eight, admission of urgent business. Do I have a mover? That council admits the consideration of the following urgent business report at item 15 of this meeting. 
Item 15.1, Appointment of Authorised Officers, Planning and Environment Act 1987. Thank you, Councillor Kleinert. Do I have a seconder? Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Laura Main. All those in favour? And that's carried unanimously. Thank you, councillors. Item number nine, planning permit applications. So there are no planning permit applications that require of a decision of council at this meeting. Item number 10, city planning. And there are no city planning reports. Item number 11, connected communities. 11.1, draft community infrastructure plan consultation <coughs> outcomes. Do I have a mover? That the recommendation be adopted, Madam Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Lang. And do I have a seconder? Thank you, Councillor Conlon. Councillor Lang, would you like to speak to the motion? Yes, thank you. Um, councillors, this is quite a lengthy report and goes into a lot of detail about our community infrastructure, which is so important to our community. Um, we've had um, detailed consulta consultation with our um, community infrastructure plan and we've had um, many um, meetings regarding um, the recommendations or um, the feedback. And I just want to congratulate officers for the report. It goes into a lot of detail which I'm not going to be able to go through tonight, but it really does set out some very clear guiding principles. Um, it is a way of us looking at what we need in Manningham for the next 20 years. It's about taking a look at what we currently have and making plans to equip what we have for the future of our residents. It looks at making our infrastructure livable, inclusive, accessible. And it does so with these guiding principles. And there are a few of them to ensure that our um, community infrastructure respond, responds to place and the community, to ensure that it is functional and that it meets the demands that are put on it. It looks at establishing new community infrastructure as part of hubs so that many residents and many services and facilities can use them. It looks at encouraging, encouraging shared spaces and facilities so that many groups can use one facility, that it is utilised most of the time, maximum use. It looks at making our community infrastructure welcoming so that people want to come back, that it has clean facilities, that it has the audio and the technical equipment that it needs. And it looks at incorporating environmental sustainability to its design so we can make our, meet our environmental targets too. So looking for solar options as well. I just wanted to sort of go through a bit of the structure of the community infrastructure plan. It looks at guiding questions that when we look at our community infrastructure, what will the questions be that are asked of our team? Well, where is that community infrastructure? How does it serve our community? And how well is it working? What are, how are things going to change in the future and how can this community infrastructure meet those future demands? What is needed? Is it needed to be replaced? Is it needed to be upgraded? Is it needed to be um, consolidated? Is it needed to be made new? And the best way is to come up with recommendations, short, medium and long, to be able to meet all those demands now and in the future. It also goes further into Council's role. So are we a planner in our community infrastructure? Are we a partner? Are we a promoter? And are we a provider? How will our community infrastructure be paid for? And who does it represent? In Manningham, we have 125,700 people, all with 54% whose first language is other than English. We're 70 six languages spoke within our municipality. 44% of our residents are born overseas. It is for all of them. So as we look into the SIP, it looks at what do we need now and what do we need in the future. It looks at the fact that we are forecast to have a higher portion of working aged people, a higher portion of older residents, household couples with working with children, 
increased in lone persons' households and growth in suburbs of Doncaster, Bulleen and Doncaster East, where the growth will be the highest and making sure our infrastructure meets that demand. It also goes into the aspects that our infrastructure accommodates, our early years, our kindergartens, our long day cares. It looks at what infrastructure we have for our youth, our libraries and our learning centres. It also looks at our neighbourhood houses. It looks at our arts and culture and looks at our community meeting spaces. It assesses every one of those aspects, asking all those questions through all those guiding principles. I would like to congratulate the team on a very thorough report and I would be um, encouraging my fellow councillors to vote for its approval this evening. Thank you, Councillor Lang. Councillor Conlon, would you like to speak to the motion? Uh, yeah, I'm happy to just say a few things. Uh, it's great that we've got this plan because this, this, I guess, is sort of like, I guess, uh, an umbrella type Thing that um, we can guide us in the future in terms of <coughs> where we, how we prioritise, uh, as Councillor Lang said, you know the sort of questions that we'll ask when we're doing this. So it doesn't, it's not getting into the detail of necessarily of what we are going to do, but it's it's providing a I guess a background for the future because these things, as we've seen with master plans, they take years to develop, and then many more years to actually enact. Um, and sometimes never get enacted, but that's another story. But um, yeah, I, th I think, uh, I, I, again, I'd like to I'd just like reinforce what Councillor Lang said, to congratulate the officers on a good uh, report and thank you for going and getting all that feedback from the community on that. Um, and I, I th yeah, I'm happy to support the report. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Conlon. Do I have any speakers against the motion? Do I have any other speakers for the motion? Councillor Stephen Main. Uh, I think my two colleagues have spoken uh, very well in summarising uh, the report. Uh, I think it is, it is very interesting and important to take a 20 year view of how you're going to provide um, community infrastructure. I really do like the suburb by suburb breakdown in the report. Um, in terms of the needs. Um, I would also love to see the, the library investment uh, at the Pines and, and Boleyn uh, come to fruition, which is, which is flagged in the report. I remember back in 2007, uh, the City of Manningham didn't own one library. We, we rented them all. And then Westfield kicked us out. We built a, a temporary one here and then we built our magnificent Doncaster Library out here and then we also stopped renting Warrandyte and built in Warrandyte a really good facility which is now uh, moving to the next level. So, but we do have two more, two rented libraries left at Bull End and the Pines with limitations and, and so that it's great to see things like library investment um, uh, in the report. Um, I will flag, councillors, that I, I do intend to, to move a supplementary motion um, on the issue of, of kindergartens and just to, to make uh, some preliminary comments. It is interesting that I think 25 of our 80 identify buildings are kindergarten. So we, it is our largest single, uh, certainly by number of sites, our largest single uh, community infrastructure um, uh, play. Now, unlike councils like, say, Mornington or, say, Knox, which historically have actually you know, employed 100 staff and employed all the kindergarten teachers and run the programs, um, our history is that we, we don't run the programs, we are, are the landlord. Um, and I do think there is an issue with, the, sp with the, the space moving so quickly with new legislation from the state about 15 hours a week and it's going to be free and a lot of pressure on, on infrastructure and capacity. Um, I think it would be useful um, for councillors and the community to get a little bit more data on the situation with our uh, 25 kindergartens. Um, so I'll, I'll get to that when I move the supplementary motion, but overall I'd just like to thank um, the officers, uh, the community for um, commenting and providing uh, feedback and uh, it, I think it's an excellent uh, program. Uh, it will be important to, to fund it and try and deliver many of the, the, uh, the upgrades and investments identified uh, over the, the journey of the plan. Thank you, Councillor Stephen Main. Do I have any other speakers to the motion? Well, I'll put that to a vote. All those in favour? And that's carried unanimously. Thank you, councillors.
So I'll move to your um, proposed supplementary motion, Councillor. So I've there. distributed this to councillors, but I'll read it into the into the official uh, program. So uh, uh, proposed supplementary motion, quote, uh, that council requests officers to prepare a report for noting at the 12 December 2023 council meeting, further expanding on the information in the community infrastructure plan by detailing the following information about Council's existing 25 kindergarten and childcare facilities. A, decade in which the facility opened. B, land and building value as at 30 June 2023. C, current lease terms and management arrangement, including the identity of the manager, if not a single site parents committee. D, 2023 program, occupancy, enrolments, and waiting list information where applicable, and E, any known material capital works projects exceeding $50,000 in value on individual council-owned kindergarten facilities over the past 20 years. Thank you, Councillor. Do I have a seconder for this supplementary motion? Councillor Andrew Conlon. Councillor Stephen Main, would you like to speak to this motion? Uh, yeah, thanks, Mayor. Look, I think it, it, anyone who drives around Manningham, it's just extraordinary the boom in the construction of new childcare centres that are seemingly going up on every corner. Uh, and it is an example of the, the fast moving space here is you've got um, some traditional standalone uh, kinders where there's only a, a kindergarten program. You've got private new operators coming in offering long daycare, childcare, plus a kindergarten program. You've got changing regulations. Um, and so this, this, this supplementary motion is merely requesting some data for noting, which I think should be reasonably easy to access, um, just to inform council and the community, not just on the history of our infrastructure, but also on, on the status in terms of the service. So informing the council on sort of what programs are being run, is it five days a week, is it long day care, short day care, um, just some basic information, including who manages the facility. So I know that, for instance, we've got the YMCA, uh, we've got uh, a group called Early Childhood Management Services, I think running four of our centres. Uh, there's another group called Sparkways. Quite a few of them are in independently managed. And if you think about what we've just done with our basketball facilities, we've just run a big tender and sort of had a big look at the facilities. Now, I'm not suggesting that we do anything radical in terms of the management, but because of the structure we have, there's not a, not, not a lot of visibility to councillors uh, about the scale of the services. So I don't know if we have a thousand kids in our kindergarten and childcare centres. Whereas when I look at Yarra Rangers uh, Children's Services Incorporated, they talk about their 22 uh, childcare centres with 1,074 children. So there's data on what's happening. Um, and so this is just a, really a, a fairly straightforward data request um, uh, to inform us in a report for noting um, as we, we look to take a longer term view on, on, on what should happen with these 25 important community facilities that are not run by us, but are importantly owned by us. And I think it's important for us to know what is happening in our facilities, who is running and how are they going uh, in such a fast moving space when other councils are making decisions, the regulations are changing, there's mass investment from the private sector, it's a fast moving space and this supplementary motion would simply give councillors some useful data on our assets and the programs within our facilities uh, for noting at the December council meeting. Thank you, councillor. Councillor Connor, did you want to speak to the motion? Do I have any speakers against this supplementary motion? Any other speakers for the motion or to the motion, I should say? Well, then I'm going to put that to a vote. All those in favour? And that's carried unanimously. Thank you. Moving on to item 11.2, Aquarina Outdoor Master Plan. Do I have a mover? May I move that the recommendation be adopted? Thank you, Councillor Stephen Main. And do I have a seconder? I no, second the motion, Madam Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Lang. Councillor Stephen Mayne, would you like to speak to the motion? Thank you, Mayor. So after a, a lengthy consultation process, uh, this is actually really exciting to have an officer report uh, recommending that we bite the bullet and proceed with a fair income upgrade 
of the outdoor facilities. Now, uh, for those of us, uh, my father, I think, uh, went swimming in the outdoor pool, outdoor pool the day after it opened in 1969, uh, and we've still got the same shell uh, from all that time back. So I think it's a fairly clear case of uh, we need to uh, replace the outdoor pool, which is very, very popular. But this report proposes that we twin that with actually a substantial rework of the outdoor, the overall outdoor facilities, including retiring the dive pool, uh, repurposing the, the toddler pool, uh, which is up there on top of the hill and rarely used these days, expanding the cafe, um, uh, developing an amphitheatre. A few people realise that uh, that Aquarina is, is one of the most popular school carnival outdoor aquatic facilities in the whole of Melbourne because we are we have the luxury of such a large amount of hill space and so providing more seating for the big crowds to come in and, and, and parents and friends to watch their, their kids competing in school carnivals and the like, um, I think would be an excellent uh, investment. So the report notes that this is um, it's a big number, 13.2 million uh, uh, in addition to the th circa 3 million that we have already in the budget for the replacing the outdoor pool. So you are looking at, at sort of in the order of $16 million, but I remind councillors that I think we spent more than that when we did our pool uh, close to 10 years ago, uh, that we are blessed with only having one facility. If you go to Merribeck or Mall, the old Morland, they've got six pools. Uh, you go to Banyol, I think they've got three. And so having one facility, which gets a million visitors a year, means you've really got to invest in it. It's open from 5.30 in the morning till 10 p.m. at night. Burundara is rebuilding the Q Rec Centre, and there was a piece in the Fin Review last week saying they're looking at spending perhaps 130 million. We are in a good, strong financial position. The 90 million in the bank, both restricted and unrestricted cash. As we'll get to later, we've underspent our capital program by about 8 million this year. We, as a group of councillors, said we would spend an average of 55 million a year. And so these are the sorts of projects that actually comfortably fit within an expanded capital works program. And I think it's an absolute no-brainer when you consider what other councils are doing on greenfield sites. We have a wonderful aquatic facility. It's an unloved outdoors. You can't leave a 1969 shell there. Um, and so I think this is a great program. The feedback has been strong from the community. It's, it's well designed. It's easily affordable. Uh, and I look forward to seeing uh, this, this proposal move ahead uh, to implementation in the coming uh, two or three years. Thank you, Councillor Stephen Main. Well put. I do just want to make one clarification that the outdoor pool is budgeted at $10 million, bringing the total to $23 million. Uh, Councillor Lang, would you like to speak to the motion? Thank you, Madam Mayor, and thank you, Councillor Main, for doing a um, summary of the master plan. Look, this master plan has gone through our advisory committees as well. I know that we've brought it to the um, Sport and Recreation Advisory Committee and we've brought it to the Multicultural um, Advisory Committee. And there are just a few really exciting aspects of the master plan that go with the upgrade of the outdoor um, facility to make this actually quite a unique venue. I'm not sure if councillors realise, but for an indoor-outdoor pool, once the master plan is implemented, it will be one of the rarest in Victoria to have the quality of um, uh, facilities and aspects to it, and it will be sought after for that reason. And some of those things are, it is rare to have an outdoor, indoor deliverable um, space where you can do the lap swimming as well as a private um, programmable pool. Um, it's also the facilities that are unique to have enough space especially undercover. There is a lot of sun smart rules now and with children being able to go out and do swimming carnivals, they need to be looked at and there are a lot of facilities that now can't be used because of that. The master plan addresses that with looking at its amphitheatre area and having shaded covered spaces. There is also regulations when there are cafes and your viewing of being able to see um, your children swim. And the master plan addresses that by having the cafe indoor and outdoor in a more central location where the viewing is um, closer to those areas. And um, there is seating around the children's pool area where parents need to be right there at the second to grab. That also looks at having um, areas 
that provides for sensory needs. And as we know that swimming is often used as a therapeutic um, and a, um, something that aerobics, there are sensory needs areas that have been built into this master plan. There is also looks into accessibility. So having the uniqueness of an outdoor indoor area and the natural hill or landscape of the area, the accessibility has also been looked into this master plan. So yes, it will be here and it will be fun for families and it will be accessible for families. It will be a place for everyone, no matter what your physical activity. It will be a place to hold carnivals. It will be a place to hold community events. It will be a place that better services all the key stakeholders that already use Acurina. And I really look forward to everybody who uses it and those who are kind of be new to coming and benefiting from the master plan. It will be a place for everybody and it will be money well spent to give our community a top unique facility that those within our municipality can use and those out of our municipality will want to use. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Lang. Do I have any speakers against the motion? Do I have any other speakers for the motion? I would just speak to the motion, motion Councillor Conlon. Yeah, thank you. Um, there's parts of this plan which I really, uh, really like, like the shade over the seating area for the for the main pool area. Uh, that's as Councillor Lang mentioned. That's an important thing. Having to having been to some sports days um, and getting fried, um, uh, or watching other people get fried, uh, I think I think that's a, that's a really good uh, thing we're doing. I like the outdoor change area is really great, um, but there's some things that concern me in terms of the overall cost of the program. It's a $23 million program all up, and I guess I, I'm wary of um, of the commitment we're making, as particularly if those costs escalate, which they tend, they have been doing over the last 10 years, or actually probably about 20 years, when it's been very hard for people in um, in infrastructure projects to actually maintain the cost that we think they are at the start of the project um, through the project, uh, and a couple of just a couple of things I'd just like to highlight that I think are on the extravagant side, um, in, according to the report, even um, the quiet program, Paul. So as it says here, unlike other recommendation and the quiet program pool provision was not identified in the community or industry group consultation sessions. However, its inclusion was re recommended by council officers at the visioning workshop to provide a point of difference for the centre and attract new users to the centre. And I guess that's what I you know, like. I'd say that's one of those optional extras, bells and whistles that I don't don't think that we particularly need. The amphitheatre, I'm still bit miffed by the amphitheatre and I think it's again extravagant because we have multiple amphitheatres around Manningham and uh, in public places and it's, you know they might get used once or twice a year so I don't know where we're going to get extra events I don't know how that's all going to happen but again I, I, I don't think that's necessary uh, and I think uh, it's not a question necessarily of affordability for the council, but it's still a question of competing priorities. And we've got, um, you know, we've got drainage issue. We've got drainage. We've got climate change and the effects of climate change in terms of increased water uh, runoff in in major events or increased major events, and how all that water is being managed. So uh, that's. That's my hesitation on this report, and I understand I'm not going to I'm not going to sink the report. But I do I am very cautious about how council spends its money, and those couple of items I personally don't think are warranted. Thank you, Councillor Conlon. That's noted. Do I have other speakers for the motion, Councillor Kleinert? I speak for the motion. Uh, I think it's fantastic. It uh, is core to. Uh, what councils um, should provide to the community. And uh, it's a, well, I have to be honest, uh, I did my swimming carnivals there, got my first uh, blue ribbons. 
uh, sat and watched other people. And um, if you have gone to school in, in this area, you would have done your carnivals uh, there. You would have grown up going to the Aquarina. It is our one swimming aquatic uh, uh, asset and it needs, it needs some love, needs some care. I think it's a good investment. Uh, it has gone through, um, yes, uh, some of our advisory committees, uh, including the multicultural committees, uh, the MDAC, which is the Manningham Disability Advisory Committee, of which uh, both of those uh, gave input into the quiet space, um, quiet, quiet pro the quiet programming pool area, and it was received really well. Um, noting that um, that is not it's not 100% of the time used just for certain people, but it's it's a place where people can go when statistics have just come out in the last 24 hours that 11% of males um, are um, accessing NDIS. Um, that shows me that there is a portion of, of a population that needs a quiet space to learn safe swimming. Uh, in many cultures that come where swimming is not um, something that they have access to, you know, we're a multicultural community. It's wonderful to be able to have um, a pool, pools that um, offer uh, and have an offer to the wider community. So I think that's it's it's great. It's an investment. It's core to what we're um, what we're about in local government. Um, and certainly, I think um, when you do it, we do it properly. Uh, there is money set aside for it. It has been. You know, we've got budget for it, um, and I think we're well placed. Uh, as Councillor Main says, we're not a poor council, but we're financially uh, smart and, and apt to put investment where investment needs to go, and we're staying core to that. Uh, and Aquarina is definitely uh, one of those core assets of, of council. I thank the <coughs> officers that have um, put a lot of time and effort into uh, these reports. Uh, including accessing um, community and our community groups through our advisory committees. It's been um, great and fundamental to shaping um, what is needed uh, to move forward. Thank you, Councillor Klein. Do I have any other speakers to the motion? May I ask a question? Yes, yeah. Councillor Chen. And no doubt that the outdoor master plan is a nice things to have, and it has no doubt that it has gone through all those consultations with the uh, advisory committees. Uh, my question is, they probably have no idea how much what that cost. 13.2 million outdoor plan, uh, outdoor master plan. Can I just bring a councillors back to the March uh, meeting about the price tag? I just want to ask a question about the price. And in the March council meeting, and we have the cost estimate in May 2022, which is 7.4 million. And then in March 2023, that is this year, and the price was escalated to uh, uh, nine, uh, about 9 million. And now it goes up to say uh, 13.2 million. So from the first price to the second price is 22%, and then there's another 46% jump. My question to the officers is, how confident are we about the 13.2 million price check, uh, price tech? And uh, if, if in the worst scenario, and uh, is there any provision to, uh, for a scale back for some of the items presented in the master plan? in the master plan. Already we have heard some concerns that some of the items may be a bit, a, a, a bit of a luxury, so I would like to have a question asked. Thank you. Thank you, um, Councillor Chen. I'm going to ask Andrew McMaster, Acting Director of Connected Communities, to respond. Thanks, Councillor Chen, for your question. Um, as part of the design process for the master plan, um, officers have sourced professional cost estimates from industry experts to inform the cost estimates and the cost of construction, which are presented to Council tonight. Um, the total cost estimate of $13.2 million is an increase from the $9 million estimate that was provided this year. 
And that's because it includes suitable allowances for uh, industry price fluctuations and CPI, noting that construction of the, uh, the facility is not due to commence until 2025, some two years away. Um, the next stage in the process is also for detailed design, so that work needs to also be carried out and wasn't factored into the previous cost estimate for Council this year. Um, and as, as councillors are aware, we've also recently, as part of our capital program, been including suitable project contingency budgets to ensure um, that project capital projects are delivered within, um, within total budgets. And that's also been um, one of the reasons behind the increase to 13.2 million. So with all of those additional costs factored in, the level of confidence of delivery within the budget is high. Um, or higher than it, um, than it was than it has been in the past um, because of those contingency factors. Thank you, Andrew. Do I have any other speakers for the motion? I might just speak for the motion myself because I do recognise that this is a, a high cost item that we're voting on. I also recognise, though, that it's a community asset that I would say as a council we have a responsibility to maintain. We don't want to close a pool. We've got a 50 metre pool that we all agree needs to be updated. We've all received calls about the quality of that pool. Um, and we also don't want to have a master plan that just has one pool. So I hear words like luxury items, but my view is as an aquarina master plan, you do want more than one pool. Um, I have spent many summers in there since 1979, despite looking young, um, where I feel like I'm in a petri dish sometimes in that pool. So I think it's really important that we do have more than one pool. So I wouldn't necessarily call the second pool a luxury item. And I also see a huge amount of benefit in having things like amphitheatres and places to sit and, and watch people swim and have carnivals. And uh, we got a huge amount of feedback from residents on wanting it just to be an outdoor space as well, an outdoor space to enjoy. In fact, I was surprised at the number of responses that we had from the community that were interested in it being an outdoor space. Um, I recognise that it is a lot of money, but I also recognise that we are fortunate in this council through um, good budget management and good um, adherence to our budget principles that we are able to budget for this and we are also able to increase our expenditure on drainage and roads and footpaths. So I'm very comfortable with this as an expenditure item and um, very supportive of this. So I will put this to a vote. All those in favour? And that's carried unanimously. Thank you. So I am moving to 11.3, healthy ageing in Manningham. Do I have a mover? Councillor Chen. I move that the recommendation be adopted. Thank you, Councillor. Do I have a seconder? I second the motion, Madam Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Lane. Councillor Chen, would you like to speak to the motion? Yes, thank you, Mayor. In response to the significant Commonwealth changes to the in-home aged care system and after much consideration, Council has made a very, very difficult decision in the April Council meeting to no longer provide in-home aged care services from 1st of November this year. But as a Council, we are still committed to the safety and well-being of our older residents and will continue to offer services that support healthy and a, a positive ageing. Funding previously allocated for the in-home aged care services will be used to establish a new healthy aging unit to guide council's involvement in supporting our older residents. There will be two strings within the unit. The navigation and support string will build on council's reputation as a trusted advisor to families and older residents who need information to enter into the aged care system and to assist in a hands-on way with residents' inquiries. The healthy aging stream is to develop partnership and initiatives to support healthy aging. 
such as uh, senior week activities, support our community transport contract, and the existing council activities. Council will work with partners to deliver activities and overseas advocacy activities such as addressing ageism. A healthy aging advisory committee will be, is, will be established to support councils in the delivery of actions already committed in our council plan and health and well-being strategy. A draft terms of uh, reference is attached as attachment one in the agenda. The mayor and I have volunteered to be a council reps in the committee, and I will be very happy to chair the committee if it's formally established. Council will also propose to introduce two new grant streams for, uh, for 2024 and ongoing. One is $60,000 per year for senior clubs activities. The other one is $50,000 for organizations, clubs, and groups to apply for fundings to support healthy Asian initiatives for the Manningham community. Manningham is already an acknowledged dementia-friendly organization, and we are aiming to meet the accreditation standards for age-friendly cities with the World Health Organization by June 2025. Lastly, special mention to the Making Aging Easy Engagement Project. Officers have engaged with a wide range of uh, variety of residents from May until mid-June. Through a lot of uh, pop-up stores, surveys, telephone interviews, and workshops to get a feel about services gap and ways that council may assist in contributing to healthy aging. The consultation will inform the specific priorities of work for the new healthy aging unit. I had attended some of the pop-up stores and information sessions and was thrilled with the level of interest and participations in the project. I was extremely humbled to receive one posted survey feedback from one 100 years old lady living in a retirement village. She actually takes time to write her feedback and, uh, on the survey and post it back to me to hand it over to the officers, uh, which I think that is, it was really a privilege for receiving that kind of uh, survey response. And the, overall, the, uh, the participation rate is high and consultation findings are very useful in setting priorities and guiding activities in those areas identified by our community. I encourage the community to read the engagement report in attachment two. So this is a report with directions to support our older residents through a range of healthy aging initiatives. So I ask councillors support to the recommendation. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Chen, and thank you for sharing the story of the 100-year-old resident and their feedback. Councillor Lang, do you wish to speak to the motion? Uh, not very much, um, Madam Mayor, because Councillor Anna Chen did a wonderful job of going into the details. Uh, I just wanted to say during the consultation period, which was extensive, and I want to again congratulate the officers and the team involved in, in making the hard decisions, putting together this proposal, and also actively going out and seeking our community's needs. It was very clear that um, factors that um, contribute to social isolation within our older adults were the ceasing of driving their own cars, having restricted mobility, and family and friends living too far away or exper um, experiencing sight and um, loss issues. And they were some of the things that our community said were contributing factors. So in line with that, Councillor Chen talked about the initiatives. The Healthy Ageing Unit looks at the initiatives of having um, not seven things that were important to our residents. Affordable activities and services, conveniently located services, activities that suit a, a more wiser person's year's timetable, uh, places of rest and seating, transportation to hubs and to activities, having the right support as they live independently, and public toilets. 
that are cleaner and accessible. And I think that that's great initiatives within this report. Again, I would like to congratulate the team and the officers. Thank you, Councillor Lang. Do I have any speakers against the motion? Do I have any other speakers for the motion? Councillor Stephen Main. Uh, yes, look, in addition to the excellent comments from my colleagues, I'd just like to uh, individually thank Lee Robson and Kerry Keneally for their stewardship uh, of this whole area in a very difficult time and to thank all of the staff um, who after October 31 um, will be exiting Manningham's employ um, because of the federal government effective uh, takeover of many of the services that we have been providing. So um, this is obviously transitioning um, to our reduced but important uh, ongoing uh, in involvement um, in, as we call it, healthy ageing aging in, in Manningham. Um, I think, Councillor Chan, I'm, I'm delighted you're going to be serving on the committee. I, I must admit, I, I'm really impressed with your dedication, to attending all the pop-ups, uh, listening to the community. It's incredibly thorough um, uh, and a good guide for all of us. And um, also, the other point I was going to make was, was one of the quirks of our planning system is one of the few things you can do on acre blocks is build residential care. So we have this much larger than average element of people living in residential care. We actually are a landlord in residential care ourselves with Manicare. So we're, we're very overrepresented in this category. Um, so it's very important that we provide all that support and as many services as we can um, in this area. And I think this is a very considered posit to our new role in light of the biggest change in Manningham Aged Care Services in probably 30 years, which is rolling out over the next few weeks. Thank you, Councillor Main, and well said. Do I have any other speakers for the motion? I'll put that to a vote. All those in favour? And that's carried unanimously. Thank you. 11.4, Advisory Committee's Annual Report. Do I have a mover? Councillor Kalanit. That the recommendation be adopted. Thank you. Do I have a seconder? I second the motion. Thank you, Councillor Laura Main. Councillor Kalanit, would you like to speak to the motion? Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. This is uh, a uh, endorsing the Advisory Committee's annual report. Uh, this basically is a report that talks about the activities and achievements of uh, the last 12 months of the Disability Advisory Committee, known as MDAC, the uh, Gender Equality and LGBTQIA Plus Advisory Committee, Health and Wellbeing Advisory Committee, uh, the Multicultural uh, Communities Advisory Committee and the Youth Advisory Committee. There's a lot, and that's not all. There are more that we do have. Um, the, the Recreation and Sport Advisory Committee is not in this report because it was only set up in the last six months. So there is some great things being done, and this is really um, committees provide a, a formal input to um, council uh, in a, to give input and guidance um, for things that we need to sort. Hence, we just endorsed um, the Aquarina, which uh, the master plan went through many of those committees for input and for guidance and for feedback. But um, let me just highlight just a couple of the great things that happened um, over the last year. Uh, let's start with MDAC, my favourite, the Disability Advisory Committee uh, and its role. It uh, provided direction on the Inclusive Connections Expo, celebrating the International Day of People with a Disability. It was a wonderful uh, expo and uh, that was on the 2nd of December last year, uh, noting that the um, moving forward, this will happen, but more regionally. So council is going to be working uh, with the region of councils. So you know that just moves forward, which is fantastic. Um, the establishment um, of the inclusive language guide and piloting in easy uh, English documents, which I'm really excited about because uh, Manningham will be uh, actually one of the first councils to actually do it. So council has been working with Scope, and it's gone multiple times to uh, the advisory group for input, um, which is really fantastic. Now, um, when we look at the gender equality and LGBTQIA plus uh, advisory committee, uh, it's uh, provided guidance on council's approach and content for a Pride March, Walk Against Vi Family Violence, um, Ido Hobbit and International Women's Day. Uh, also, um, 
they assist in monitoring the implementation of the uh, gender equality uh, action plan, which um, was birthed out of the uh, Gender Equality Act. So we have a compliance um, local government does to report back on that. So that definitely helps. The Health and Wellbeing Advisory Committee, that was actually, it's a mandatory of all local governments to, to have such a, uh, a committee. And, um, and that provides implementation on the health and wellbeing strategy and action plan. Uh, so that's, you've got supporting implementation um, of the um, Vic Health um, local government partnerships. So you have stakeholders uh, that come to that meeting. It's always chaired by the mayor. Um, also, they participated participated in the Manningham Gambling um, Policy Review. So some great stuff being done there. The Multicultural Committee Advisory uh, Community, sorry, Multicultural Communities Advisory Committee, um, also done some great stuff um, supporting the implementation of the Welcoming Cities Standards. So. Council was uh, one of the first in Australia to become a welcoming city. Um, very proud of that we have that in Manningham. And uh, certainly um, that's an ongoing, um, to, to hold that accreditation, there's a lot of ongoing work that um, happens and, and they support that. They've participated in workshops on the establishment of inclusive language guide and piloting easy uh, English documents. So I really love that two wonderful, very different committees have worked on the same document which uh, enables a huge portion of our of our population um, to to benefit, which I think is great. Um, they've also um, participated in the consultation of the draft uh, arts action plan, Active Manningham, and mental health services, which provides um, support to multicultural communities. The youth advisory committee uh, been absolutely enthusiastic, and there's some great leaders coming out of that. And uh, they have uh, supported mental health advocacy for Headspace in Manningham, which has been absolutely exciting. Uh, consultation on the Climate uh, Emergency Action Plan, Skate Park Project, Ideas for Youth Projects and Council Budgets. Co-hosted the inaugural uh, uh, Principals Breakfast, uh, which I think is, is really um, fantastic. And I, I'm really great that it happened again this year because it's the only opportunity that our schools in Manningham come together because the state schools have a compliance by the state to meet. But that's all the time. May I ask for an extension of time in this important? All those in favour? That's carried. Continue. Oh, thank you. I vote for that as well. Yes. Uh, thank you. I've assumed. Yes. <laughs> uh, so very exciting because you know, the, the schools that are um, the independent schools, the Catholic schools, as an example, um, they don't get that opportunity. So Manningham hosting this means that those schools have an opportunity to network. It was wonderful seeing the youth advisory there and speaking and speaking so well. So I think um, really there, there should be, I commend them all for their efforts and their leadership. Um, there's also a slight addition to the terms of, of conditions. Um, the terms of reference, which basically means that we will have an annual report rather than reports coming throughout the year. And that's just basically, um, you know, it's just a really anomaly, but it's really important what these um, committees provide. Um, they are advisory, so they advise. It doesn't mean that, you know, everything that they ask for, you know, gets um, endorsed by council, but certainly they're an important part uh, wonderful commitment of each and every community member that's on it. I know that um, there's, in the next coming months, uh, there'll be some EIYs for some of those committees as some of the uh, members sunset. And um, and certainly if you have a community has an interest in joining, I encourage my fellow councillors to reach out to um, your networks to encourage them to put up their hand. Having this as a first touch of local government being on a committee is a really great great thing in helping shaping our community. And as you can see in a nutshell, um, those, those committees have done a lot. I commend and thank uh, the officers through um, all their directories, directories, directorates, that would be right. Um, the officers, there's a lot of work that goes in the background to make these, um, these meetings happen smoothly and the follow-up that goes on. So I thank um, all the officers for their tireless work and commitment <coughs> to making them great. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. It was a good summary of all of the work of, and as you said, not all of our committees. Um, 
Councillor Laura Main, would you like to speak to the um, motion? Yes, thank you, Mayor. I'd just like to further thank the community members for all their contributions. We really do value their insights and all the time that they give their, to their community. Um, I always enjoy and look forward to like the committees um, that I'm on. There are some really inspiring members and I'm, yes, always looking forward to it. So thank you so much. We really appreciate it. Thank you, Councillor. Do I have any speakers against the motion? Any other speakers for the motion? Councillor Anna Chen. And I think that it is very important just to use this uh, this uh, a few uh, this few moments to express the importance to touch on the uh, the importance of youth advisory committee because this is the first youth advisory committee within council, and therefore the establishment of Maya is of really of uh, great significance. We all know that the purpose of this committee is for young people between 16 and 25. There is an age uh, requirements and to build their skills and leadership capacity uh, in the advisory community setting and the experience they gain from the committee will be very useful for their future employment and education settings. It is also important for council to hear directly from young people which it, it, which used to be a gap from sitting feedback from our community, from our community, which might just fill the gap, which is really, really great for us as a council. So since Maya's establishment in 2022, uh, the members have been contributing in, uh, as Councillor uh, Klein mentioned about the youth mental health advocacy, and providing feedback in a range of council's plans and projects and even budget priorities. It is also important to note uh, this year, my year has confirmed three items of importance, which uh, the first one is youth mental health. The second one is opportunities for youth engagement. And the third one is cultural events and festivals for youth participation. These are the top three priorities identified by those young people. So these priorities are important because they will shape the focus of MIAC this year <coughs> and also will provide council with information to be considered in future decision making and advocacy, uh, any advocacy projects related to young people. I want to thank all the members for their great work and uh, dedication to Rinsha, Malila, Alyssa and Barry. You were amazing table host at the July Principal's Breakfast. A big thanks to our officers, Michelle and Pamela, to put together very practical and interesting agenda items to attract our members come back all over again with a quorum. And so I look forward to working together to achieve those real, uh, with real time. outcomes in these areas. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Obviously, our councils love talking about our committees, which is great. Do I have any other speakers for the motion? I will put that to a vote. All those in favour? And that's carried unanimously. Thank you. Item number 12, City Services. 12.1, Nature Strip Guide. Do I have a mover? That the recommendation be adopted, Madam Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Carly Lang. Do I have a seconder? Thank you, Councillor Conlon. Councillor Lang, would you like to speak to the motion? Yes, thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, Manningham's Council's Nature Strip Guide um, specifies the requirements in relation to the maintenance and the use of our nature strips um, to ensure that there is provisions to keep safe and attractive nature strips. Council is one of those places that gets lots of community feedback and consultation about nature strips, either the, whose role it is to maintain or whether they need, um, whether they want to do something on their nature, nature strip or whether they would like the, the nature strips um, maintained in a particular way. So from all of these CRMs, all these customer feedbacks, the team have put together a clearer guide so the last nature strip policy was dated back to 2015 and hadn't been reviewed since. So this was a review of this previous policy and to make the, sure that that policy, the guidelines in there are still adequate and also to update it to make it more clear. 
So the intent was really to have clear principles on the maintenance of our nature strips and to clarify what services um, on organisations uh, nature strips are for. It's gone through many departments within the organisation and within the review it has then suggested, and I can really encourage the community to look at the diagrams within the report. The report really does give you a very clear diagram of what is the nature strip and what distance needs to be left between the nature strip and the road so that people have safe access out of their vehicles, where we can put out your bins, where there are services that go underneath that nature strip. Then there's a part that can be used for grass, can be used to be planted out with low shrubs. And then there is another part that needs to be kept clear so that the footpath has space on either side for people to have safe mobility access and movability around. So it really does go into um, the roles that each person can play to keep their nature strips attractive and, um, and functional and safe. I do want to just highlight a few things. It goes into a clear definition of what a nature strip is, which is really important. It does talk about the benefits of a nature strip, what services it actually provides and what needs it has, has for the community. Our nature strips are actually about a sight line so that vehicles can move around our streets as well. It looks at the changes in the documentation where it gives it a section called planting with ground covers. So now a resident can apply to council to plant a part of their nature strip out with ground covers, following the principles outlined in this report to ensure that safety is still maintained, those distances are still maintained and that attraction is there. In those native grass and low shrubs, that also adds to the biodiversity of the areas too. This is not for, uh, for residents to go planting trees on their nature strips. That is a responsibility of council. And there are, there are um, times where we do have to remove uh, vegetation that has been put on our nature strips and where applicable, council will remove that and then put the plant back in the resident's garden or on their doorstep so that they can use it in their property. Um, so I would ask my fellow councillors to endorse the plan um, the guide, sorry, tonight to con join me in congratulating the officers in the hard work that was done, the consultation, going through all the CRMs, um, going through getting feedback from councillors and really making our nature strips something that is unique, is safe, is functional and is attractive for our residents. Thank you. Love to speak to it. <laughs> um, yeah, thank you, thank you, Councillor Lang, and I'd like to also thank the officers for great work. If you look at the previous policy, it's basically a page of nothing, a short paragraph, two, two or three paragraphs, and then a page of yada yadas. So um, it's like this is a great ex uh, expansion of our previous policy into a guide, which is quite, uh, I think, is quite useful for people. I, what I'm looking, really looking forward to is being able to drive down our streets of Manningham and, and going down those streets and you see some of them um, where people take great pride in their, their um, I guess their, not just their property but the nature strip which is the council's property and council's responsibility. And I think this is a great opportunity for us to improve the streetscape of our our um, streets and make it something that um, yeah people will be proud of. Uh, it's an optional thing for people to plant out their nature strips, but there's some really good guidelines. And uh, in doing the review with the officers as we developed this 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 guide, it was clear that not many other councils actually have such a a well-defined guide about what you can and can't do on your nature strip. A lot of it's very general, and I know my mother-in-law lives in uh, Whitehorse, and uh, it's sort of like it's all a bit of a free-for-all, and it, and it can cause issues, particularly if you're you know things are planted up too close to the curb, uh, and you can't get out of your car, or um, or there's uh, 
uh, bricks or whatever or land edging that causes a tripping ha hazard. This is very clear about, this guide is very clear about the opportunities for people to enhance their street and enhance their property. Because when you look at a property, you actually look at it from, you know, from from the boundary to boundary. You don't think of, oh, that bit's the council's bit and that's their, their bit. I know a lot of people think that the first two metres of the of the of the bitumen are theirs as well in terms of car parking spaces, but uh, that's not the case. <laughs> as everyone is, uh, as everyone is fair game for everyone. That's that space, but. I, I really am proud. I think we should be proud, councillors, of the work that the officers have done. And I, uh, if we approve this guide, um, yeah, look, I look forward to seeing the consequences of of this. It won't. Well, it's not going to happen overnight, but it will. I think over the next ten years, you will see a significant improvement in the in our amenity in the streets. But not only that, by giving the guide, it gives the officers a very clear. Um, point to go back to people who have actually done the wrong thing and I do know there's a number of um, uh, there's a number of places around in our streets where people have thought that the council land is actually their land and treated it as such and you know they put little things to make make sure that people don't walk on their nature strip or it's actually the this, this public nature strip so it, this will be this will be a great way for officers to effectively enforce the fact that it is our land and there's some things that we can do and uh, we allow residents to, we will, will allow residents to do it's very clear in fact you don't even need to apply you can just plant it out as long as you thank you councillor time us. I'll ask for another extension for example. all those in favor oh can I have a seconder my apologies councillor oh, Chan. I can't. I, uh, oh. Okay, I'm going to get my act together. Can I have a mover? Yes, Councillor Laura Main, can I have a seconder? Councillor Anna Chen, all those in favour? I didn't think Councillor Stan Main was going to put his hand up then, <laughs> but that was carried unanimously. Continue, Councillor Conlon, you have two more minutes. Yeah, thank you. And I just lost my train of thought. Um, <laughs> it was part of our strategy. <laughs> yes. It, uh, it was to do with, I guess, what people can and can't do. But there is an opportunity there to actually... Uh, I, I really appreciate the fact that in the guide, there's also there's special situations where people will need to actually do more substantial things that is actually allowed in this guide. And it clearly sets it out in this guide where, that you'll need to go and apply for, for a permit from the council in those con conditions. For example, if you're on a steep slope and you think it'd be better to have a retaining wall and you'd like to put that in yourself, um, then you can actually, there's a process. It's, it's very clear in the guide. And I think those are the sort of things that we are, I, you know, we talk about working together and I think we work, this is a great way to work with the community and with our ratepayers to make Manningham, keep Manningham as the best place in the world to live. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Conlon. Do I have any other speakers for the motion? For the motion? Yes. I would like to speak. Thank you, Councillor Chen. Well, the ability for property owners to plant in front of their nature strip uh, with slow growing uh, ground covers is a very significant change in this, uh, in the 20, this 2023 guide. And known to a lot of residents in Manningham, under the current nature street policy 2015, a permit for plant uh, for planting or, or growing those grow growing uh, anything will require a permit. Not only a permit, you require public liability insurance. So the this guy said that well, under exceptional circumstances, you need a permit, but otherwise you are good. But we are still need to be very cautious about the safety issues because as a council, we have legal obligation to provide safe environment and minimize any potential risk for our residents. So if any immediate safety risk is identified, council will ask you to remove the, the, the so-called risk. If the safety is immediate, if safety issues is uh, immediate, so council can just take actions immediately just to remove the risk. 
But as Councillor uh, Councillor Collins said that, well, council is willing to work together, and I just encourage that residents, if you're in doubt, ring and talk to officer before you undertake any work. So that is a safe, safe uh, very safe uh, measure to take. Otherwise, we love our plants, we grow it. It is very heartbreaking to remove it. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Chen. Do I have any speakers against the motion? Any other speakers for the motion? Councillor Kleinert. I can tell we're passionate about nature strips. Mm. Who would have ever thought? You know, I just want to say that I love this and I concur with my fellow councillors. It's one thing um, that I just want to acknowledge that people that are a bit creative with their nature strips are those that care for the environment, they have pride, they love where they live, they love Manningham, and I feel this empowers them with guidelines. And it reminds those that don't care about Manningham, don't cut their grass and make it look tardy, and which really makes those that are doing the right thing feel really upset. I love this because this is now being more culturally to say, love where you live, take care where you live, have pride where you live, and hopefully those uh, nature strips that are left ugly and, and overgrown, that people might even think about just cutting them nice and neat, don't have to add, it's not what we're, we're not inviting people to add and make gardens in nature strips, but you know, there's a pride thing about this and I think it's a really sound guide um, and it encourages pride in where you live um, and your neighbourhood and your fellow um, community that they are able to still utilise ex exiting their car safely and, um, and getting to the footpath in a safe way. It's a really great balance. And again, um, should it be endorsed in its entirety, uh, it's always, you know, council welcomes if you've ever got a question, if the community's got a question, there's a guide there, but they can still come to council and, and get some you know, clear guidance. But this empowers, and hopefully it highlights to those that don't care for their nature strips to maybe consider and think about mowing um, about keeping it a bit tidier than what they do. Um, and certainly on that side note, um, if you've got a vacant block next to you, you can call up council and there's a process which is very separate. But this is about amenity um, and this is a really, it's a great document. So thank you, thank you to the officers. Thank you, Councillor Clarence. Do we have any other speakers for the motion? Councillor Stephen Main. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Look, sometimes when people ask you what do you like about being on council? I often say it's the diversity of what you have to deal with. And 10 years on council, this is certainly the first nature strip guide I've ever had to consider. Uh, and I'm gonna rate this one in my top 20 things of this term. I really do think it's an excellent guide. We didn't have to do it. The officers have just been flat stick with a whole new review of our local laws. And effectively, this is in the sort of the local laws territory. So from a workflow program to deliver this so soon after doing the local laws. Um, and I think we've got the balance right. I mean, you can, you, Manningham is unique with our 5,500 uh, above, above one acre low density residential. You, you know the old story of, you know, well, you didn't do the footpaths, you didn't do the drains. And so, you know, we can do what we like on the nature strips because, you know, you left it to us. Um, and I think this gets the balance right of it's got a little bit more flexibility for people who are doing some modest beautifications and, you know, not just the, the mowed lawn, but with some precise measurements and guidelines in there. I think we may see a little bit more enforcement coming as well because we have some good guidelines that we can anchor that to. And there is some areas, particularly in the, in the, uh, in the country areas of Manningham, if we call it that, where I think it is unsafe. You know, you have to walk on the road and you should be able to work, walk on the footpath. And that safety issue that Councillor Chen mentioned um, is very important. Um, so I'd like to thank uh, the officers, the combination of the legal side, Andrew McMaster, Helen Napier, who, who was the, the point officer in, in terms of the detail for getting the balance right. Um, and just celebrate the diversity. You know, this term we've, we've, we've been deer culling, 
cat curfews, nature strips, you name it, it's there. Um, and this, I think, is good. I, I know we didn't do any sort of formal community consultation. Um, I think the nature of it probably lends to that because it's not a policy. It's, it's, we can't make people do it. It's in that sort of gray area of, well, this is ultimately our land, but effectively you're maintaining it for us community. So uh, it, is, it is quite a unique area. Um, and I do hope that we advertise this far and wide after we endorse it, because I think a lot of people will be really interested in it. We'll look at their own footpath, their own nature strips in light of it, ask questions, think about a few things, and it'll generate some good discussions. So overall, I think this is a really good story, and I'm really looking forward to voting for it. Thank you, Councillor Stephen Main. I'm going to put this to a vote. All those in favour? And that's carried unanimously. Thank you very much, everyone. We do love our nature strips. Item 12.2, end of 2022-2023 financial year capital works report. Do I have a mover? So moved. Thank you, Councillor Stephen Main. Do I have a seconder? Councillor Kleiner. <coughs> Councillor Stephen Main, would you like to speak to the motion? Thank you, Mayor. So uh, we've reached the end of the financial year and this is the formal end of financial year capital works uh, report. So I guess the high level numbers is uh, we ended up spending, I think, 45.9 million of 54.8 million. There is an 8 million carry forward. That was still a terrific effort in light of all of the challenges that everyone in the capital works space uh, at all levels of government, private, you name it, is facing in the current environment, post-COVID, you know, you know, it's supply chain, labour shortages, uh, all, all sorts of issues. So, I think if you look at the the um, the breakdown of the program in terms of what we actually spent, the biggest number was roads, where we spent 11.1 million, um, with renewal being 8.6 of that. Love to see the fact that we actually spent 2.29 million on footpaths. We have been cranking up the footpaths since that excellent 2018 change of policy where we fund the lot and don't ask the residents to chip in for new footpaths. Drainage, we spent 3.78 million. We have cranked that up and the buildings program was 10.4 million. That's everything from uh, you know the, the new Deep Creek Pavilion for the baseballers um, to MC2, MC squared uh, cladding out here. There's also um, uh, I, should, I should probably note that in terms of the, the carry forward um, on what we, we said at the start of the year and we're carrying forward, it's, it's a couple of projects of note such as a Hepburn Reserve where we're spending $2 million. We haven't spent the full amount that we allocated. Um, Don Bale Reserve Cricket Nets delivered slightly late but almost ready to go now. A fantastic, uh, fantastic project. Um, in terms of closed projects, uh, I think probably the most notable was, was Macedon, where we, we made a decision during the year that we wouldn't proceed with what was going to be a $3.5 million project spread over a, a couple of years. Um, but all up, uh, we're in a good position. Um, uh, it's a good comprehensive report. We did well to spend as much as we did. We have capacity to keep spending more, uh, and we've got uh, lots of good plans on which to allocate our, our Capital Works budget to in the coming years. Thank you, Councillor Main. Councillor Clement, would you like to speak to the motion? Yes, I would. It's a, it is a, a wonderful outcome, 86% uh, delivered. Large portion of Capital Works um, provides significant tangible benefit to the community. Um, you know the footpaths that we spent? You know that equated to 6.2 kilometres of walk. That's pretty good, isn't it? That's core. Cool. The successful delivery of many projects were on time and on budget, and I commend the officers for that in our last um, financial year. Um, and it's in line with our um, council financial plan, which is it's great. And it's not easy to achieve, considering um, Councillor Main was correct. It was um, we faced challenges just like um, the rest of. Um, Victoria did, um, including sourcing um, contract, um, contractors from the market on several projects, um, having to be retendered. Um, so sometimes we went out to tender and had nobody bite because there was nobody that was had the capability um, or the materials. Uh, materials were still a problem. Um, as an example, in the current industry, um, the wait time for drainage pipes is six months. And we often forget that. Um, so, you know, amongst these realities that we have to work with, we've done incredibly well, um, and that's thanks to 
um, the staff um, through the director of um, Rochelle Quatrocchi, who's in an acting role, but um, under your, your directorship, um, it's a lot of work that gets done in extremely um, hard conditions, but I'm very proud that um, meeting 86% is very good. And if you look at um, our light, light councils, um, we, we fared um, favourably against uh, those others. And it's not that it's a competition, but what it says is um, we were organised, um, we're forward planning, um, we have a team that's dedicated to, to outcomes and um, certainly uh, it's something that I'm very proud of. It's a, it's a very good report, the, um, the Capital Works report that ends uh, the last financial year. Um, we report every, every three months on the, um, every quarter on the last uh, three months. So um, obviously that financial year is done and dusted. We're almost uh, about to report on the next. But um, you know the work is continuing. We, uh, as a council, have uh, pushed the organisation um, with bigger capital spends um, than ever. We're not um, we're not staying in first gear. We're certainly uh, pumped it up as hard as we can. So I commend the the organisation for doing the best that they can with all these uh, significant obstacles in their way. Um, so thank you. Thank you, councillor. Thank you, councillor. Do I have any speakers against the motion? Any other speakers for the motion? I'll put that to a vote. All those in favour? And that's carried unanimously. Thank you. <coughs> Item number 13 is experience and capability, and there are no experience and capability reports. Item number 14, Chief Executive Officer, 14.1, Audit and Risk Committee Charter, Draft 2023, and Independent Member Remuneration Review. Do I have a mover? Uh, Mayor, I'd like to move a, an alternative motion uh, that the Office of Recommendation be adopted with an amendment to A, make the Audit and Risk Committee chairperson's increased fee in paragraph B, 12,000 per annum, brackets 2,400 per meeting, and B, add the words rounded up to the nearest $100 to the end of paragraph D. Thank you, Councillor Stephen Main. Do I have a seconder for that? I second the motion, Madam Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Laura Main. Councillor Stephen Main, would you like to speak to the alternate motion? So, Mayor, just to explain uh, that, so we, we last reviewed the pay of our independent uh, audit committee members in July 2019. Um, at that time, we chose not to adjust the chairman's fee of 10,500. Uh, and we did a modest increase to the fee for the two other members. So what we're approving tonight is a lift in the chair's fee to $12,000 per year and to the other two members uh, up from $7,250 to $8,000 uh, per year, which, as the report notes, is, is modest uh, compared with uh, other councils. There hasn't been any adjustment for, for four years. So um, I think it was appropriate to have a, a modest increase. And there's also some... Uh, modest tweaks to uh, the charter of the audit committee, um, taking in some changes to legislation and some other minor points. But uh, that's uh, the nature of this uh, report, which I think we should support. Thank you, Councillor Stephen Main. Councillor Laura Main, would you like to speak to the motion? Um, not much to add, just that this has been a long time coming, so I encourage my fellow councillors to support the motion. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Laura Main. Do I have any speakers against the alternate motion? Any other speakers for the motion? I'll put it to a vote. All those in favour? And that's carried unanimously. Thank you, councillors. I'm now going to move to 14.2, informal meetings of councillors. Do I have a mover? That the recommendation be adopted, Madam Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Carly Lang. Do I have a seconder? No, I second the motion, Madam Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Laura Main. Councillor Lang, would you like to speak to the motion? No, thank you, Madam Mayor. Councillor Laura Main. Any speakers against the motion? Any speakers for the motion? I will put that to a vote. All those in favour? It's carried unanimously again. Thank you, councillors. Item 14.3, documents for sealing. Do I have a mover? I move that the recommendation be adopted. Thank you, Councillor Laura Main. And a seconder? Thank you, Councillor Conlon. I will just put that to a vote. All those in favour? And that's carried. Thank you very much, councillors. 
Item 15, urgent business, 15.1, appointment of authorised officers, planning and environment, Act 1987. Do I have a mover? Councillor Kleinert. That the uh, recommendation be adopted. Thank you, Councillor Kleinert. Do I have a seconder? I second the motion, Madam Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Lang. I'll put that to a vote. All those in favour? That's carried unanimously. Thank you, councillors. Item number 16, councillor reports and question time. Councillors, would anyone like to provide a report or raise a question? Councillor Anna Chen, quick off the mark. Thank you, Mayor. I would like to ask a question. And many about a many community engagement policy, which outlines uh, the principles and methods the council will use to undertake well-informed and inclusive community engagement. Although council is committed to listening and understanding our community, there is still invisible barriers migrants face when they wish to share their views, but may not confident <coughs> in writing when English is a second language. The invisible barriers cannot be ignored because Manhattan is a multicultural community. Our community consists of residents born in 111 countries and 76 different languages spoken. According to the very recent ABS data, more than 46% of Manhattan residents speak a language other than English at home. Currently, many his main community languages are Chinese, Greek, Italian, Persian, and Arabic, which accounts for 35.6% of many his population. Are we able to proactively remove barriers and support inclusiveness by accepting input in at least the top main community languages? And how about our young people who may not feel comfortable uh, comfortably expressing their views in writing, but prefer to use uh, video or other digital methods to share their views with council. I will appreciate a report to council on how we engage with our multicultural community and our young adults. And further improvements, any further improvements identified in the proposed reporting timeframe. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Chen. Would you like a response now? Would you like a director to reply to your question now? Yep, so I'll ask Karen Patterson, the Director of Experience and Capability, to provide a response. Thank you, Councillor Chen, for your question. Um, as you know, we continue to seek ways to improve communication and engagement with our community and recognise that our community is diverse and we have a range of different people, um, as you rightly point out, a number of them that speak other languages um, and a range of ages, including young people. Um, we are very happy to bring a report back to Council, as you've requested, uh, and we'll take into consideration the points that you've raised to further remove barriers for our community. Thank you. Um, a time frame on when we will bring the report back to council. Um, well, can I take that on notice and come back to you? Thank you. Thank you, Karen. Other councillors would like to make a report or ask a question? Councillor Kali Lang. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, I'd like to make a resident um, volunteer report. Uh, the Wonga Park CFA um, have this month councillors hosted their volunteer night where they recognise their volunteers' years of service as well as their exemplary um, um, professional standards. So there were many um, volunteer CFA um, residents that um, go out when we, all when we all run and it was worth acknowledging them and it was really humbling uh, for the Mayor and I to be a part of seeing them be rewarded they were the sort of people that you could see that they felt uncomfortable for being rewarded because they don't do it for the rewards. They do it to protect their community um, and their, the much loved area that they live in. The other volunteer um, report I wanted to give was our fireball. So that was a very successful event, raised um, over $60,000 for a new tank for Wonka Park CFA. And over a decade, Fireball Committee have done an incredible job raising funds for the CFA brigades. Now a storm is getting behind the CFA. The new 
colour, red is orange. And I say this because now the storm is getting behind the CFA means that a thunderball committee is picking up where the fireball committee left off. And we are hosting a gala event in 2022 to help Manningham um, SES um, purchase a new 4x4 vehicle to assist with the wonderful work that they do for our residents in emergency situations. The CFA are a vital part of our community that selflessly turn out in floods, storms, search and rescue events, and they are there for us no matter what the event might be. I couldn't be more proud to let you know that the Mayor and myself are um, volunteers on that committee and we encourage any residents who would like to join us. Um, we wish the rest of the committee well and we'd like to see you get in touch with your orange so you can attend the fire fireball and we will, be, um, we will be hosting events to raise money for our CFS, uh, SES. I just wanted to let you know that the Councillor convener time. is but Sandy Miller. Thank can, you. Sorry, <laughs> say that. That's important. <laughs> the convener is Sandy Miller. Thank you. Thank you, Sandy. But Councillor, can you just confirm the date for the, the year for the uh, Thunderball? Is, sorry, it's 2025. Thank you, Councillor. Other reports or questions, Councillors? Councillor Stephen Main. Uh, Mayor, I'd like to report that uh, the first night football match was played at Tedajani Reserve under the new council-erected lights two Friday nights ago when the senior men took on Aquinas. And there was about 300 people there. It was incredible. The vibe was amazing. Uh, the President, Greg Chivers, had set up the, the speakers and was running commentary during the game and the music was going and the fire was going and it was just a phenomenal atmosphere. The community came together. The juniors were all invited down for the first night game since 1996. Uh, and uh, they won. They beat Aquinas by two points. And then last Friday night, they had the Battle of Bulleen, when the under-19 Bulleen Temple team took on Marsland in what they called with Old Marsland was the Battle of Bulleen. And Marsland won with a rush behind three seconds before the siren with another 300 people there. So Friday night footy at Tedajani. Forget the G. It's at Tedajani now. And um, so the, the, the club is really happy with council having delivered this. So thank you to the officers for, for getting it done. Um, it's a, Tedajani is an amazing community hub. I remember it was opened 11 years ago after we spent around about $8 million. It's got so many different activities there from the three different footy clubs to the, the seniors meeting there, the churches meet there, the scouts, the community house. Uh, it's probably the best example of a hub in Manningham. And... The fact that we've now got lights uh, and people can play at night uh, is terrific. Um, I think there was discussion at RASAC at the Recreation and Sport Advisory Committee last night about allowing community access at our lighted facilities. So it's not just the clubs that can turn them on and off. Uh, one of the officers mentioned that he on his, on, his, on, his I, on his iPad can turn the lights on and off at Petty's Reserve at the moment. So that sort of remote control, get the community in, don't just let the sporting clubs have it. But it's a great facility. We've got a great record from Timber Ridge to Zerbies, to Ryshex and now to Tadjani. Recent investment in new lighting facilities, increasing utilisation, getting kids active, getting communities together. Friday night footy at, at Adjani, it's just a great result and thanks to everyone who helped make it happen. Thank you, Councillor. Any other councillors wish to make a report? Yes, Councillor Conlon. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, a couple of things. Uh, firstly, I just want to acknowledge the work of Ryan Smith as our member um, and is, you know, he's moved on. But uh, it was great to see him at the Fireball the other night and uh, he's moving into his new career. But he, just to acknowledge the passion and hard work he put in for our community over a number of years. And uh, he'll, be, he'll be missed. And, uh, you know, there's obviously an election this Saturday, so um, we'll have a new member. But uh, I do just want to give a shout out to Ryan as a, a really approachable, dedicated, um, always follows up, and uh, I don't know he'll do great in his new work. And yeah, he was he was definitely a great guy to have a coffee with, and just mull over things. So um, yeah, I'd just like to give you a shout out to him. Just a, just a second, really quick thing, just in regard to our decision on Aquarina, um, the I guess I'm a bit concerned about the process where we started with a project that was seven million dollars, ended up with thirteen, and now you know we could still go on. 
So I, I'd like, uh, it's probably a question for the CEO, could, could we have a look at the process to make sure that when things come up to council at the first, we've got a, a, a conservative estimate and the, the community is aware of that estimate when we're consulting them in terms of the cost of projects because um, you, you can sort of, you can, I guess you can get caught out and not have nowhere to go if you've gone along the journey and it's gradually increased or a steep increase has been at 80% 80, 80 increase. So just a, just I think we can improve on that process of making sure. Um, so yeah, not you don't have to respond now, but thank you. I'll ask our CEO, do you want to say a few words? Yeah, Councillor Colin, Connellan, uh, I think it's really important that we do provide confidence about cost control of our projects and our project management methodology. So we can definitely provide you some information on that. Any other councillors? If not, I am going to, I've got three things, so I'm going to have to speak quickly. Firstly, I'd like to congratulate the Victorian Electoral Commission for piloting a, um, a, a morning, a morning and afternoon for people with um, sensory concerns to, to vote early um, in the current by-election. I think it's a wonderful initiative and I'm really keen to see the results of that and, and how that can be rolled out. I think it's a really wonderful initiative. I'd also like to invite Manningham residents to the Mayoral Charity Gala coming up on Friday the 8th of September. Sadly, in Manningham, we have a higher incidence of dementia than other municipalities. So this program is looking at what we can do to deliver dementia services to sufferers of dementia as well as their carers. And we're looking at doing some programs like a memory lane cafe across the city. So um, Doncaster, Lower Templestow, Wonga Park, Warrandyte and Park Orchards are some of the key locations and, and perhaps Templestow. Um, but we need to raise money. So $30 from every ticket goes directly to the cause. So I'm asking everybody to look at how you can get a table together and come and have a huge amount of fun as well. And thank you to our sponsors for that. And finally, not to tarnish the Mayoral Charity Gala, Friday the 8th of September, but I would like to ask the officers a question on the back of the item on our committees. I would like to ask the status of the Historical Society's working group that we did endorse first in November last year, then in May. Um, I'm really keen for that to be up and running and I just want to understand the timings of when that's actually going to have its first meeting. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Um, I might direct that question to the Acting Director of Connected Communities, Andrew McMaster. Thank you, Mayor, for your question. Um, I'll have to come back to you and take the question on notice in relation to timing. Um, certainly for the benefit of the community, <clears throat> in May last year, um, the council endorsed a historical societies working group to consolidate and support our existing historical societies um, and also hear from them on our heritage initiatives across council. Um, as you know, I am um, acting in the role tonight and I don't have that information to hand, but I'm certainly happy to take it on notice and come back to you with the information. Thank you, Andrew, appreciate that. Thank you, councillors. I always enjoy that section of the meeting. Uh, item 17, confidential reports. We have no confidential reports this evening. So the meeting is now closed. Thank you everyone for joining us. <laughs>